Welcome back. In this video, we're going to develop some mathematical notation that we're going to use throughout the remainder of these courses to help tie together some of the various concepts. We've talked about the prediction and the recommendation tasks, or the score and the recommend tasks that a recommender performs. And we've talked about different ways of computing some of these scores. So what we're going to do here is we're going to describe a general mathematical notation that we're going to use to represent scores and then recommendations. We're also going to talk some about how recommendation interacts with search and with context-aware computing. A question that we commonly get when we're teaching recommender systems is, how does it relate to search? And while the exact answer you'd get on this question might depend a fair amount on who you ask, we're going to provide uh, one answer, one perspective on the way they integrate and one way to think about how they connect to each other. So, as I mentioned, we've looked at two key tasks for a recommender system. In the predict task, or more generally score, we try to predict how much a user is going to like an item. This might look like trying to predict their rating, or it might look like estimating a probability of how likely they are to buy the item. And then there's the recommend task, where we try to produce a list of items that a user might like to purchase or consume. Often, we do recommendation by just recommending the top predicted items or the items the user is most likely to purchase, but not always, and the notation we develop is going to be able to account for both of these situations. So mathematically, we can think of prediction as a scoring function. S of I given U, uh, sometimes we're going to write this as S of U I, that produces a score for a particular item with respect to some user. The difference between the semicolon and the comma is not mathematically meaningful. We're just using it for convenience to group different kinds of parameters to this function. What this function does is it computes the score of an item i for a user u. And this kind of scoring function is at the heart of many recommenders. Even recommenders that don't just recommend the top scored items often start by scoring items and then doing some kind of a modification or manipulation on top of those scores. So, so far our score it depends on the item and the user, but what about if the user is searching for something or they have some particular context? They're at a theater where maybe they want recommendations for the movies that are currently showing at the theater. Or it's 11.30 a.m. on the street corner, so the restaurants they're most interested in are lunch within a half a dozen blocks. So how can we integrate these? How can we treat these in our general way of talking about scoring and recommendation? And one way we can do that is by, uh, by expanding the definition of our scoring function. So we can talk about a score for an item that takes into account not only the user who's going to receive the score, but a query if the user has some search terms. Uh, maybe they're looking for uh, Asian food. And then you would limit the recommendations to uh, restaurants that have Chinese or Thai or Indian cuisine. And then uh, the, some kind of a context which we'll represent by X. And different systems are going to use different variables. A traditional recommender that just tries to suggest what items is a particular user going to want to, uh, to buy or read is going to just depend on the user. It scores items for a particular user and estimates that you are going to enjoy watching the Iron Giant 4.5 stars. A traditional search engine doesn't use the user or the context, but simply scores items based on how relevant they are to some kind of a query. Uh, for example, Java date formatting, and all you care about is whether the item is relevant to the query of Java date formatting. A personalized search takes into account a query and the user's history. So if you're searching for Python and you do a lot of programming queries, then the personalized search engine can know about that and can you give you results related to programming in the Python language. But if you're a herpetologist who issues a lot of queries related to various snakes, then the personalized search knows that it should favor, uh, it should favor results having to do with tropical snakes instead of programming. And uh, context-aware recommendation takes into account the user 
and some context attribute, such as currently at the theater, so recommend movies that are on one of the 12 screens. And finally, some systems take into account all of these. Context-aware personalized search, which is what you get by default using many major search engines today, such as Google or Bing, takes into account the user's history, the search query they, at, they entered, as well as context, uh, contextual variables such as their location, so that when you search for a restaurant, uh, uh, you search for lunch, it will prefer restaurants that are near you and are consistent with your previously expressed preferences and behavior. So a lot of what we're going to do through, throughout the course and what we've done in some of the, the things we've already discussed is provide different ways of computing the scoring function and then different ways of using it. In content-based filtering, we've seen how to compute the scores from a user's taste profile uh, expressed in terms of content attributes, such as movie tags or restaurant descriptions. Uh, demographic recommendation looks at user demographics and then segment and pre segmented preferences, uh, such as what uh, books are commonly read by people with the, the user's uh, particular demographic information. Association rules provide us with a way to compute scores in the context of a currently displayed item. And then the collaborative filtering techniques that we'll be talking about in the next course will compute the scores based on users' preferences and the preferences of other users in their community. But this isn't a course in scoring systems. We're talking about recommender systems. So we do have to make that leap from scoring to recommendation. So we are interested in scores and we can use those or scale those to become predictions. But then we want to define an ordering function that, taken a set of items, gives us back the order in which we should present them to a set of users. So if you consider examples that we've looked at at our introduction, if we're recommending movies, what are the first 10 movies that should appear on the screen? And for this, we can take that same type of formalization using an O for order, take a set of items that we're recommending from, and that may be the universe of all possible items, or it may be in an application that we're already within a category, or that we're within a set of items that we're considering because these are the ones we're trying to promote this month because we have excess inventory, and score them, again, with relation to a user U, a query if there's a query present, and a context X. So, when we think of traditional top-end recommendation, the way that systems do it if we don't do anything more creative, we start by computing our scores. For every item in our set of items I, we compute the score S. We then sort the items in decreasing order of score. The thing with the highest score, if they're on a zero to one scale, the one closest to one becomes the first. The lowest score becomes the last. And if we want to recommend n items, we give you back the first n of the items as our ordering. But that's not all we can do. So we might tweak our top n recommendations to match different objectives. For instance, it might not be a whole lot of fun if you showed up to a recommender. Let's use one for books as an example. And you're a great fan of the the writings of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, and you really enjoyed The Hobbit, you enjoyed the Lord of the Rings series, and it comes back and says, hey, I've got 10 great books for you. I've got The Hobbit in paperback. Oh, and I have The Hobbit in hardcover. And I have The Fellowship of the Ring in paperback or hardcover. How about the Lord of the Rings three-volume series in paperback? or maybe in hardcover. Well, you see where I'm going. You might decide there's too much similarity if those were the first 10 items that were recommended and impose upon your ordering a diversity parameter. Say, I don't want my top N items to be too much like each other. I'm not changing the scoring. All of these are the most likely items that the person would purchase, the most likely items the person would read but they're not the best items to present at this moment. There's other reasons I might prioritize my top end. 
I might have a very good scoring function that computes the likelihood that you're going to buy, let's say, a set of groceries. I've got ketchup, I've got uh, anchovies, Tabasco sauce, you name it. Maybe even sriracha. But inside my system, I might realize, wait a minute, I'm not recommending specifically to figure out what you're going to purchase. I'm recommending to try to make money. So I might also have behind the scenes a little bit of data on which items are likely to be high value. And my order function might take those scores, which are how likely you are to enjoy this item and purchase it, and reweigh them a little bit so that, you know, I realize I don't make that much money on ketchup, but I make a lot of money on anchovies. I might nudge anchovies up a bit in my ordering function. So that the top N is not necessarily the N highest scores. We also may think of this as an extended example of recommendation where N is a specific parameter to our ordering. This happens a lot if you're thinking about the layout of things on a screen. Now, you can have recommenders that would look at this for different ends across the board, that if you ask for the top five items, they're not the first five of the top 10. That could be the diversity example, but there's other examples. But there's also some very special cases here. Like the order when N equals one, if I've got one shot to get a recommendation to you, I may have a lot of things that go into that one shot, such that it may not be the top item that I would have put in a 10 item list. So we can extend our recommendations by including that parameter N as a parameter of the order to recognize the fact that the order may be different depending on what's in the destination. Is this a 10 item list, a five item list, or maybe even you know, a single item coupon that I'm printing at the register? So we've talked, we've, uh, hopefully you've seen here, that recommendation can conceptually integrate with search and context awareness. Throughout the remainder of these courses, we're going to be using this notation. So when we're talking about a way to score items, we're going to write an S function. When we're talking about ordering, we're going to write an O function. And a lot of the things we talk about are going to be more ways of computing these functions. Individual algorithms, we're going to talk about collaborative filters and various machine learning techniques for computing scores and computing orderings. Uh, also, we're going to talk about hybrid algorithms that compose S or O from subsidiary scoring and ordering functions mixed together in some fashion. So this notation is going to be reappearing throughout and it's going to serve as the general uh, notational framework on which we hang a lot of the rest of the material in this set of courses. Thank you.